Yes. It's like, it's like an actual TV show where we know we've actually gone live and we know that there are people just coming into the room. Welcome to everybody. We can see the counter go up. And, and Reed and Chris, you might not, I don't know, have been in a room with people who are so frenetically focused on alumni in the same way that A, I am, and B, no doubt you think about a lot. So uh, this is a this is a intense collection of people who think about relationships with former employees. We'll give everybody 60 seconds to warm up whilst you both warm up your throats, ready to chat about the favorite topic of all of us. That's it. Anybody that wants to do the operatic sort of preparation, you should feel free. I will not do that because my singing voice is um, something out of some kind of nightmare. I was born- Mine is worse, I assure you. Is it? My parents yeah. say I excel in some things, but that I really lost the draw in anything cultural or artistic or talented. So we'll leave it to Chris if we need to do that. I take requests if necessary. Okay, well, when we have a halftime break, and I'll introduce you both now, we'll obviously uh, pass off the uh, message to you. And just before we kick off, the team like to quickly pop up a poll, which is at what stage is your corporate alumni program? Is it more than a year, less than a year, pre-launch, none? Are you thinking about it? So um, Reed and Chris, you've probably seen that pop up something we always ask everybody. Um, welcome everybody. My name is Emma Sinclair and I am CEO of Enterprise Alumni and thrilled to have uh, many guests joining us today. Um, I'm under no illusions that it is the two gentlemen that it thrills me to be able to introduce uh, and to have join our webinar series that has attracted many of you today. And for the very many we know that listen to this afterwards, again, I know that it's not me. So some very quick introductions and then uh, we'll get to the topic that everybody's joined us for. Um, for those who don't know Chris, yay, he founded, advised, or has invested in over 100 high-tech startups since 95 and has become a leading expert in the art of blitz scaling, uh, dedicated to teaching individuals like me uh, and organizations how to plan for and execute on hypergrowth. Uh, Chris has co-authored two New York Times bestsellers, Blitz Scaling and The Alliance with Reed Hoffman. We're used to cookery shows where they say, here's one I made earlier. So here's one that I made earlier. Uh, well, you can see a pen in it, so it really is used. Uh, Chris, when you first reached out and spotted Enterprise Alumni, it was a real thrill, as um, the Alliance is a Bible for those of us who have a long-standing interest in alumni. Uh, our second guest, Reed, who has played an unimaginably vital role in building many of today's leading consumer tech businesses. A little bit hard to write um, an introduction for you, Reed. <laughs> many of you will know, in fact, as everybody on the line will know, will afterwards know, we co-founded LinkedIn in 2003, where no doubt lots of you will be connecting uh, with lots of you afterwards. And in 2009, joined Greylock um, to invest in startups where he's on numerous boards, including uh, huge companies like Microsoft, who, of course, uh, acquired LinkedIn. Um, I have a long list of questions and we'll also have some that we pose today. And we have received, I have 73 questions received in advance to answer you all. So we have minus six seconds to get started and five seconds each to answer the questions. Um, Especially since the police are after us. It is. <laughs> also like a hotspot and a game show where you have like a tiny ticker. But we're going to pick 10 of the questions at least to get through. And I wanted to kick off with one uh, where I'm a little bit biased. But if we just think about the last decade, and you have both obviously known each other a long time. For me, the Alliance is coming up, I think, on its 10th birthday. And it talks about how to build loyalty and mutual trust between employees and employers. And all the things that my team and I spend all day talking to people about. Do you think much has changed since you first wrote the book? Has it turned out that employee engagement and the way that people think about engaging with alumni who are still, frankly, customers, friends, brand advocates, has in a decade that shift morphed into what you wrote about? Well, I guess I'll kick it off, although Chris might have more, more depth. I think it's small steps. Um, I think the universe in which we portrayed as to what is the changing nature of industries, changing nature of the employment relationship, changing nature of career trajectories is it been exactly accurate. And I think companies have done small steps in adjusting to it. Um, I'd say the primary thing that they've kind of done is gotten very comfortable with the so-called boomerang, which is the, oh, actually, in fact, getting people to come back uh, is a good thing. And so, you know, try to do that because it's the... The, the fiction of that you um, that the the normal career the normal trajectory is that you work here your entire career that fiction is now kind of like yeah yeah we 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 know that's a general fiction um, they still haven't absorbed the entire 
portion of it. And it's even true at, at, at um, you know, kind of, you know, uh, places that are kind of leading the charge in this, like LinkedIn, because, you know, one of the things that, you know, some of the executives like Kevin Scott, who's the CTO of Microsoft now, uh, used to do the first interview saying, what's your next job after LinkedIn that you want to kind of transmit that we are here to transform your career. You're here to transform our company, you know, as a way, way of doing this, but not as a, well, we're starting from the fiction that you will necessarily be here your entire, your entire career. So I'd say the industry forces and changes have gone full force. I think the industry response or the company response has been small initial steps. And I would Chris, concur. I don't know if you've seen more. Yeah, no, I concur with exactly what you said, Reed. I think that it is still the case that the alliance is very much at the forefront of thinking. Right? People have not just adopted the ideas wholesale yet. I think they're still completely relevant. I think there are also two different factors that have increased its salience and have more people starting to think that way. Uh, in many ways, I would say that we have entered into a world where people generally accept the ideas of the startup of you, which is Reed and Ben Kaznoka's previous book from 2012. And we are now, I think, on the verge of people understanding the importance of the alliance. And the two things are, first of all, from a uh, industry standpoint, the rise of the gig economy, even though most people don't participate in it, has caused people to understand, oh, the relationship between people and companies is not what we used to think it was. Right. The gig economy just makes large, uh, writs large, the idea that, look, everyone is actually in this and trying to pull together a career that is not going to be something where you do the same thing for 50 years and then retire. So I think that's increased the salience. I think the other thing, and frankly, this just makes things easier for companies that want to build alumni, is there actually are channels directly to folks. And LinkedIn is probably the most responsible for this. I mean, if you think about in 2014, if you wanted to reach out to alumni who'd left your company years and years ago, whatever information you had on them was no longer any good. There's no permanent way to contact them. Whereas now, as long as their employment at the company is a core part of their professional identity on LinkedIn, you can actually find your alumni and, and reach out to them. So this makes it a good time for companies that really want to build out their alumni relationships. A hundred percent. And, you know, I listened to that and obviously you're preaching A to the converted with me and B with everybody listening. And, you know, you said, Chris, people have not adopted alumni at wholesale. We've talked about why this resonates, how boomerang hires has come a really long way. Um, and intuitively, it resonates with everybody at a very senior level, at a junior level. Uh, um, and we all know spending so much time and money recruiting, retaining, upskilling, then saying thanks, bye, is lunacy. There's no other crucial asset that anybody would treat as so, disposal, as so disposable. But one of the really big, big challenges we have, whether it's HR being the sponsor of alumni, whether it's marketing, whether it's a chief revenue officer, whether like many of our banking customers, it's actually a CEO sponsored initiative, is how do you put return on investment? How do you build a business case for alumni? And that may seem like a really specific question, but it feels really relevant because I don't think in my time, and no doubt for both of you, anyone ever said, well, this is a ridiculous idea. I mean, you know, it makes total sense. Um, and yet a year on, certainly from our perspective, there's a real challenge on putting value on community, even though we all know it makes sense. When you think about the Alliance and when someone stops you at a dinner and says to you, you know, I've read this a hundred times, but how did you, and how do you suggest that people mobilize people to talk about the value? If, for example, it's not just HR, because Boomerangs, of course, is very trackable, but we've, of course, got a, a reducing workforce in some place right now. Big question, but it's yeah. probably the question. We had 25 questions on this this morning to ask you in various guises, and it's the thing we get asked the most. And, of course, we have various processes. But I'd love to hear, like, intuitively, if you were sitting opposite of sort of someone asking both of you to justify why they should have this, other than saying, I know we should because it's Reed Hoffman and Chris Ye, what else might you say? <laughs> well, I have initial thoughts. Or, Reed, if you want, you can go first. Either no, way. no, I don't want to trade. I'll trade off. Go yeah. that's, that's the pattern we usually do on all of these webinars. We've done yeah. a few of them over the years. I bet. So the thing that I always tell people about how do you justify ROI to folks is you have to break it down and look at all the different components of value. Because if you try to look at it as a whole, it's just too complicated. And so you have to look at the individual ways that value gets added, and then you can quantify those. 
One of them, which you already mentioned and which Reed mentioned before, are the boomerangs. Uh, every number, every employee that comes back, there's a savings in terms of the actual fees, in terms of recruiting, but also even in graver savings because they're people that you know are culturally compatible and already have some of the right habits for working at the company. So I would argue that people probably underestimate the value of the boomerangs, but nonetheless, they have a way of counting it. Now, there are two other primary ways that the alumni can add value, and it becomes a little more difficult. And the last one is the most difficult of all, but we'll get to that. The second one, of course, is that in addition to referring potential employees, your alumni can refer customers, partners, and various other folks like that. And the entire industry of marketing has developed an incredible infrastructure for attribution. So take advantage of things like links that provide attribution and use them when you are reaching out to your alumni, when your alumni are referring people in, try to make it a little more systematic. And if you can count the number of customers, if you can go into your CRM system and understand the point of origin as alumni, and you actually have that as a specific thing, then you have a much better chance of quantifying the sales impact of your alumni. And that is, of course, a hard dollar cost that gets people excited. Increased sales, of course, we love that. The final one may be the most important of all, but it's the hardest to quantify. And that's what we call the network intelligence. So we talk about network intelligence in the context of employees as well as alumni, because what you're trying to do is as a company, you want to have all these sensors out in the ether picking up on signals from the marketplace. Like, for example, these days you may be trying to figure out what am I going to do about this generative AI and chat GPT stuff that everyone can't stop talking about. And if you can only rely on the information inside your company, that's going to be challenging unless your company is an AI company. So you need your employees to be able to reach out to their networks, but you need to be able to reach out to your alumni and find out what they're hearing as well. Now, the best thing I can come up with in terms of quantifying that is, first of all, to ask yourself, which of these key insights came from our alumni? And based on those insights, maybe we can quantify them, or maybe we can compare them to the cost of spending on things like Forrester and Gartner, great services, but uh, they are not the only way to learn about the world. Your alumni are another great way to, to learn about it. But then there's also just the strategic question, to what extent did our alumni help us make the most important decisions that are going to allow our company to thrive? I'd say a couple other things to add into, you know, Chris's excellent, you know, kind of framework to this, which is... Uh, first is, you know, one of the things that you have in your corporate alumni is you have people who kind of not just the culture of the business, all the boomerang, all that Chris was talking about, but are the most kind of familiar, have been committed, et cetera. And so, um, you know, not just as question of network intel to the last point that Chris was making, but also as kind of ambassadors uh, into the world. And obviously, you know, if 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 the employee, you know, Sarah or Bob is working at this other um, uh, company, they're going to first recruit for that company. But like, for example, you know, people get, you know, inquiries all the time about like what companies to work at and so forth and can be a uh, channel. Um, I think they also can be the, the the question around. All right. So, you know, kind of what sort of future are you seeing? Like, you know, Chris was mentioning, you know, chatbots. And I think those are important now. The more macro point is it's not really a, you know, you opened with kind of a cookie recipe, you know, joke from the, from the, um, you know, from the book, but it's not a one recipe fits all. Um, and I think that the thing that's actually most important for companies and individuals to be doing is to be experimenting. And so to your conversation about like, how would you converse with people about it? We'll start saying it's like, well, what do you think if we have, you know, you know, X, you know, hundreds, thousands, whatever of employees out, you know, former employees out there who have dedicated some portion of their life here, et cetera, et cetera. What's the way that we could activate them in useful ways? What would be the thing that would be most useful to us? And how do you get a good kind of ROI of a two directional, you know, thing going? Because too often, of course, people say, well, the easiest thing is just like my current employees who I'm paying. Uh, and I just ask them things like, well, but you're not paying them anymore. And has been um uh well, that's interesting um yes yeah, it switched the audio feed somehow yeah uh but it seems to still be working yes we uh, can still hear you yeah that's bizarre oh i think that may be the mac this mac bizarreness right which is like oh your iphone's near you let's capture it through your iphone you're like ah someone's really got to oh. tell me yeah stop doing that <laughs> um and so um <clears throat> um, but anyway, so 
uh, I will switch that back after I've, I've finished this point, um, which is, you know, to, 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 to engage, not just that, let me tell you what the value of our alumni is, but to engage in the thinking of, here's a set of assets we have, here's the missions we're trying to do, and we're not paying them now, but we can establish a channel of, of, of joint communication and, and, and operation. How do we essentially do that in kind of effective ways? Um, and then you kind of say, well, because, you know, part of it is also, how are you innovating? So like at LinkedIn, you know, one of the things we do is we do like speakers events and other kinds of things because it combines what we're doing for current employees together with, you know, bringing in alumni, um, you know, as one instance of, of end things that we're doing. Uh, for this, and that's that's part of I think part of how to look at that, and 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 I'll let you move to the next thing while I fix my Mac. <laughs> it's okay, you fix it, and then it will flip back again, and we will just sympathise with you. We we I feel your pain. Um, not that we want to trash Apple, and we love Apple, and we love our iPhones. I'm sure. Um, I Especially if there are representatives watching right now. Precisely, <laughs> you are thinking of buying an alumni network. We particularly love Apple today. Um, I, of course, I always think of alumni as a channel, and you just mentioned that in particular, Reed. Like much like customers and employees, it, it's a it's a it's a group of people that you want to maintain a narrative with, and it's just again, it's very very intu intuitive. But I know for many people listening, and for lots of people that do a lot of writing around this, it's a source of frustration that they're not given the same importance. I firmly believe in a chief community officer, but I'm also running a business and can't move all tides in the same direction all at the same time so maybe by the time i retire that will firmly be in place um but i wonder whether you have ever thought of alumni as a category do you think about it as offboarding i'd love your feedback on that because the offboarding part very often sits with mm -hmm. hr where i say traditionally is not actually the place where intuitively that is managing a conversation with people again that's kind of falls to comms but that's where the boomerang hire uh, you know, statistics sit with. So I wondered if you've thought about, you know, you set up LinkedIn, you wrote a book called The Alliance, alumni became something that was more firmly on the map and someone actually talked about it that had gravitas and had done some research into this. Has it evolved over a decade? Is it a, is it a sec had you expected it to turn into a sector? Had you expected it to turn into a vertical? What, what are you hoping uh, might happen. And, and I want to say, you know, we're going to be part of that journey, hopefully, of what you're hoping will happen, because I do alumni all day, every day. But it's been a decade. I'm like, do we not feel all companies should be doing this by now? Well, the you know, there there is a history of different organizations that have made huge impact to the organizations. Um, the obvious one that many people experience is universities. Um, but there has also, of course, been you know, a variety of, of, of firms uh, that have done uh, great work on this. And, you know, the most natural one has been all the various consulting firms, whether it's management consulting or accounting and so forth, partially because they, they directly tie their alumni into revenue streams um, because there's an, there's an immediate tie to that, which is actually, in fact, uh, very helpful. And it's, of course, the reason why they would invest so much in it. Now, they were willing to do it before the Internet because it was so key. Part of the thing that the internet has brought is the internet has made it so that it is actually, in fact, much easier to do in a in a lower cost way while keeping that two directional communication. So the hope, as per your question, is that um, you know every uh, thriving and great company will be like you know uh, Stanford, Harvard, etc., or McKinsey, you know, um, you know, Accenture, etc. And we'll go, no, no, actually, in fact, our, our alumni are an important part of, of what we're doing. Channel, as you were describing, Emma. And, and obviously, it, it depends a little bit on what you're, the, the size of what you're doing is. And, and again, to my earlier comment, the idiosyncrasy is what it is. Um, not everything most naturally aligns to revenue. And you know, revenue is obviously one of the really important things. But for example, part of the reason why you know, Chris and I from the technology industry say that network intelligence is important is, is is if every company is on path to becoming a technology industry and the technology drumbeat is moving faster and quicker, you need to be trying to figure out how to get some perspectives into your company that are not just like, like that are the sensors from a field. You know, one of the places where all companies tend to go wrong is they tend to think we know everything, like everything, know, everything that's important for us to know is within our boundaries, or maybe we happen to read a web page and you're like, well, Actually, in fact, that's not the case. 
And part of the thing that is, you know, like I think some of the most useful thing to be gathering, and this gets to your HR point, is to say, well, HR doesn't really, you know, say, well, what's the, what are the signals that we should be getting about how technology is changing the industry, how customers are changing, other kinds of things. What are the signals we should be getting? HR is not set up for that. Um, and so you need to set up something for that as part of what you're getting. And by the way, this is the exact kind of parallel is the kind of thing that has made, you know, all of the great management consulting firms work because they do that, right? They yeah. go, you know, they McKinsey, Bain. They've got yeah. a reputation for doing for, They've got yeah. a lot of people that do that with events. And it's so yeah. interesting. I had a chat with one of them today and they're like, we're trying to move away from canopies and champagne and go for data. Yes. And I was like. Yes, <laughs> yes. exactly. <laughs> Not that there's and, anything wrong with canopies and champagne, but they're not the end of the world. They're not the end all be all. No, and they don't. Not the end all. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but but we all like a nice snack. But it was like music to my ears because it's interesting. Law firms, consultancy firms, in the world of alumni, before you enter it from a data and software perspective, everyone's like, well, that's completely nailed. And certainly they have always prioritized and emphasized that that is a a channel of people that they should definitely be communicating with. But the way they've done that has been more traditional legacy software, kind of pays and champagne. Obviously that has, you know, that's, that's fine, but it also only caters to a small group of people or people in a very specific location, which is a little exclusionary. And of course today we can all meet anywhere and everywhere. Um, I wonder, you know, when people leave, they, we always say this very politely when we're talking to people, but frankly, they just, they don't really care about company news, right? That, that you've opened a new office in Spain and that you sponsored an, a, a marathon. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, very nice, but doesn't really get anyone excited. If I think about the LinkedIn alumni network, which we are enormously proud as a software company to power, it tends to be social, celebratory. It has some pretty amazing swag. And it was really, you know, motivated to have an extra an extra layer of an engagement and very specifically to say to this community, you matter we are specifically doing something for you. We have a lot of questions, including some that are coming in on live chat here about the what's in it for me. If you were talking to and knowing the audience here is predominantly alumni leaders who may or may not have any software and frankly is quite often one person with a bunch of spreadsheets that's responsible for thousands and thousands of people and no wonder it's quite hard to manage. Do you have some sense or some advice that you can give to people that's based off of that honesty you talk about in, have always talked about right let's just be honest people are going to leave the example you gave of the linkedin ceo where are you going next can you talk a little bit about that because it's a real challenge i think for marketing people understandably they want to share all the wonderful things that the company is doing but not always the thing that really gets people juicily excited i'll let you say it not me well one one quick thing before um you know handing in our trade-off over to chris but um <laughs> One of the things that I think has been a side benefit that we've noticed at LinkedIn, and thank you for all the work on this stuff, um, has been that people to some degree do implicitly track how people who are former employees are, are treated. Um, and the fact that if they're like kind of treated well in terms of, hey, we, we still value you, we still connect you, we still try to provide value to you as part of the ongoing thing is actually something that that causes i think longer retention and 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 people more engaged because they're like oh this is the kind of place i want to be it's the it, it it's self reinforcing it's actually even in the in the current uh, place and i think part of you know like at linkedin i think that part of the um, the question that to your thing and i'll hand over to chris is that look the easiest thing of course is to say let me let me take the like company kind of bulletin board, you know, and, and I didn't just because post it out. It's like, well, but like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing other things. Like whether or not you open an office in Madrid doesn't really matter to me. And that may be great, but like, it, it's like, I get overwhelmed with all kinds of things, you know, do things that are useful. Now, you know, for example, if you look at, you know, what universities have done is they have like class notes and they go, well, here's what's going on with other people that, you know, you knew and you care about you know, as an instance, well, that's interesting, right? And, and that kind of thing is the, the, is, is more thing. Cause it's like the, it's, it's who, who is a company to some degree. It's, it's all the, the strong it. relationships you created there. Yeah. I, I always say it's a bit like people magazine. I don't tell anyone I read it and I kind of don't read it, but if I see it at the airport, 
dashboard, I'll have a quick flick and see who's wearing what and just stuff that I don't usually admit. Because, of course, we all wonder where do people go? How are they doing, right? A hundred percent. Um, Chris, from you, perhaps. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say, you know, you're you're standing in line at the grocery store. And what else are you going to do? There's nothing wrong with that. Thank you. People Thank you are more much. dignified than some of the other tabloids that might be out there anyways. Uh, <laughs> I, I think Reed has hit the nail on the head in terms of looking at it from the perspective of you know, the universities. And they have excelled in this. They've spent centuries developing this. The class notes is a great mention. Like, for example, I'm a, a graduate of Harvard Business School, and the class notes are one of the primary ways that we stay in touch. And the other thing, of course, which you, know, you can adopt without necessarily putting on a bunch of different costs, is to make sure that the gatherings you produce are structured like reunions, where people who were around the same time are coming together. We saw this happen with uh, eBay. And when John Donahoe was CEO there, he talked about how they would hold alumni events with people who were roughly from one class. So the same couple of years they joined at the same time. And this creates this network effect where people say, oh, I'm going to go see my old friends. Hey, let me reach out to these friends and make sure they're going to be there. And you can actually get the alumni doing some of the work of, of getting people there. And you're uniquely as a company in a position to convene these kinds of groups because that is the thing that ties them all together. So leaning into the social element of it is critical. The other thing I just want to highlight, Emma, because you mentioned it already, is swag. It is astonishing how even like millionaires in this world love stuff. This is something I learned from Reed. Reed is a, a brilliant gift giver of personalized gifts. And I think that the main thing is just, you know, don't just reach into the marketing team's closet and pull out what you have. Build something that's specific to the class, to that alumni group, to that event. It won't cost much more but it will make it much more exclusive and something where people are like, oh, you missed out. Let me show you. I got this fleece. And it talks about, you know, class of whatever. That is actually something where you get a disproportionate benefit for the resources invested. Yeah, I will say that, like, we have an enterprise alumni hoodie. I mean, who doesn't when they're a software company? Um, and it is, and I was really scared to wear it when we were just testing them out. I remember this in the early days, but I had no clothes. My luggage hadn't arrived at our office in California. So, of course, I wore it, and it caused mass chaos about who didn't have one. So we should never underestimate FOMO. And I tell you, we have hun so many use cases of some of the alumni networks where they're kind of quite high net worths that are involved in them who... There's 100 books available written by the chairman. Everybody wants a book. Forget 100. It's, it's fascinating, right? We, we all like a little bit of a fun gift. Um, I will also say before I, I move to the next question, it's slightly surreal, Chris, when you say, when talking about community, to read that he has hit the nail on the head when he is kind of the nail and sort of made the head. But I will roll with it. Um, it's just I might as well acknowledge that out loud. Um, I think what we're saying, a, a couple more things before I go to some other uh, questions from the team here. So good people go to good companies, right? And we are all reading the news. People are being made redundant all over the world. Silicon Valley, you name it. Uh, during COVID, we had quite a lot of use cases um, where people were standing up alumni networks really fast because they were about to have to offboard a lot of people. And they were like, there's a good way to do it. Allow people to continue to have the perks and the benefits and stay in touch and some CV workshops. And there's a bad way to do it, which is thanks by let's switch you off. It is really fascinating that, you know, ultimately, good people go to good companies, as you both said. Alumni is a long game. But of course, you know, people have jobs where they feel they need to deliver immediately. Um, it's been, a, it, again, I'm the founder of a company that powers alumni networks. Of course, we want everyone to have one. But it is somewhat mind blowing when you see a large company saying we're going to have to lay off 10 to 20 percent of people switching something off and, and having no interest. Do you have any counsel or advice for some of the alumni managers that um, will be listening today or, or in due course who want to do the right thing? But quite often we hear stories of one or two people who are like, I can only speak to 300 people a week and stay in touch with them. What advice do you have about elevating that offboarding right now at a tricky time is going to pay dividends? Well, there's a couple different parts to your question. So one of them, which I think is the most relevant, is to try to make the company broadly aware that offboarding is that when you're doing that, it's the time that you're, it, it's a high impact on the image of your company. And so, for example, 
you know, I think just recently we saw an interesting compare and contrast between Microsoft and Google uh, in their layoffs where, you know, I think a lot of people noted within the Valley that Microsoft was, you know, being kind of human and generous and Google was being like abrupt, like some people learned that they were no longer employed when their login credentials didn't work and so forth. I mean, just literally absurd, absurd things. And that that then causes a, well, how, how, how much does this, you know, like, is this a good place to work? You know, employee, like working branding is kind of key as per the, you know, people like to work at places that value them and that, that, and that kind of, and that operates. And so I think that's super important. The other thing that, to note about the overall thing is, you know, there, there's kind of some weird layoff logic where most of the layoffs were between 10 and 14%. Um, and in, in most cases, that was less uh, that was less layoffs than had been hired in the last two years, like during the pandemic. So to some degree, you know, the, the press, and it obviously feels very painful to people lay off, but the, the dynamic is like, people were getting over their skis and getting out of, uh, out of uncertain during pandemic, and now they're kind of resetting. But that resetting is not, you know, like one of the things to point out to your company is that resetting is not like, well, and then next year we're gonna do another 14%, and next year we're gonna do another 14%. It's like, no, no. We're doing the reset in order to grow again. If you want to be able to grow, you want to offboard well. You want to make those those kind of conversations happen. Now, if you say, well, I've got like one person, I'm tasked with 300. It's like, well, how do you do that as best you can? The fact that you can't do it as well as you'd like, which is a personal kind of statement and all the rest, but like make sure your operational processes work well. Make sure there's something that's appropriately human. Like, you know, one of my, um, uh, you know, kind of entrepreneurs and and CEOs that I've had the delight and privilege to work with is Brian Chesky, and they hit it the worst at the very beginning of the pandemic. And they started this whole thing of like, look, we know we have to do these layoffs. These are really good people. We hope to hire them back. We are going to then publish the directory. We're going to do everything we can, even though we're in this, like, you know, two thirds of our business evaporated one month. Now it regenerated very quickly. It was good. We're still going to do that. And that's part of what makes people go, oh, Brian's awesome, Airbnb is awesome. And when they articulate their values of we are our people, they're not lying. They're actually yeah. right about it. And that's the important part of, of everyone in the company, not just the person, the people who are responsible for offboarding, not just the people who are responsible for alumni, understanding that that's, that's what this thing is. Because it isn't a this day play, it's a this decade play. Yeah, and you know, I... Um that authentic authenticity point like a brian example i think that you have to know brian or his reputation to know that that is very um reflective of his personality even though i won't be cross he didn't reply to my email saying start an alumni network um but yeah you know ultimately everybody's doing it now right and it's really interesting because we we see everything now about that um and, and google is such an interesting versus microsoft example because google x have an alumni network and they too are suffering and i have to say it is no doubt they will do the right thing, but it's gonna be really interesting to see what they do this year with their alumni network in the face of cuts. Um, we've got a few questions here, and one of them is who do you think, oh, sorry. I want to add one thing on this point, just because Reed articulated very well the example of Airbnb, and I want to expand on it. I also want to just mention one of the reasons is the people, right? Brian Chesky, a very emotionally fluent leader, Astro Teller over at X, very emotionally fluent leader. So it's not a surprise to me that they're actually doing a great job with this. But the thing is, the reason why offboarding is so important is because of what's known as the peak end principle of psychology. That is, we evaluate an experience based on the peak level and the end of it. And in most cases, in terms of offboarding, the people who cut off the, the, the access to the login, that's like the worst possible way to end it. And one of the things that Airbnb did besides the incredible support, the severance packages, the, the helping publish the people being laid off so that they could be hired, one of the cleverest things, which didn't cost anything, was they had people's last days be on Monday instead of Friday. Wow. And the idea was, listen, everything, get everything wrapped up on the Friday, on the Monday. It's just about people spending time with each other yeah. on the way out, saying goodbye, saying how much they meant to each other. And that's not something where you as the alumni person have to do the work. It, you're not the person who spent, you know, two or three years working side by side with the person. It's the fellow employees, the co-workers and building that bond, honoring that bond, allowing people to really say goodbye in the proper way. 
I think pay huge dividends for Airbnb. And it's something that every company can do if they have to go through a layoff. Yeah, I mean, you'd think so, right? It makes complete sense. Um, and I think, um, you know, that last experience cancelling out possibly every good experience you've ever had is such an own goal. But I think, you know, I often, from my perspective, although the two of you will be infinitely more um, insightful about this, think it sometimes takes a decade for a large enterprise to do something that it's talking about doing and maybe even not necessarily well, but getting started. It's a longer cycle and we understand because you don't have 100 people, you have 100,000 people. Um, but you know, who? we've got a couple of questions here around the things that we're discussing. And one of them is, who do you think cares most about that? Because we have lots of people that know this matters and lots of people in various levels of large organizations who subscribe entirely to what you're saying. And yet, you know, I can think of conversation after conversation where we'll meet an alumni lead and they'll be like, you know, I just want their last experience to be a positive touch point. And we have people like using their own budget to give a small gift or write an email, which is not their job, right? The alumni network or the alumni leader is not, it's not necessarily their job to email 1,500 people who've been made redundant. So who do you think cares most about this? Because we know all the different layers it resonates with, but unless you're C-suite and a lot of people listening to this over the course of the next year will, probably won't be, how do you tap into that? Um, that's probably the last question about that. And then I've got some um, here that are quite specific, which um, it might be really fun to ask you. Hmm. Well, I would say that the, um, again, part of the thing is, is you're matching, it's almost like kind of various versions of product market fit. You're matching what you can do together with what your objectives are. And it never might be the biggest thing you could do. Um, you know, one of the reasons why you know, the swag thing is nice is because your company already does a bunch of swag, so it's 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 just the cost of the of the doing that you know kind of in addition, um, and again that's another thing to kind of think of as a tempo. It's like well we're doing you know LinkedIn speaker series. Well let's invite some alumni. We're 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 we're, we're doing this. Let's let's do this. Like it's kind of as as a, as a as kind of a way of making it happen. Now um, I think that the key you know one thing that's probably useful is for people to you know kind of uh evangelize you know kind of what what the what what the what the prospective value is to kind of c-suite and so forth um and a little bit of the um you know one of the things i think is interesting is is like you know, kind of what's going on with interesting alumni and other kinds of things, the same thing that kind of reads the class notes, that could be, you know, something that's, that's potentially useful um, as a, as a way of kind of saying, hey, you know, like, here is this, this network, you don't, it, it's making it visible, right? That's, that's actually, in fact, what I would so say, it's like, like, for most people, it's like, oh, alumni, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And it's like, well, make it visible in some way. And then that's part of the reason why we started this with a, like go and look at what it is. And by the way, you know, LinkedIn's an obvious way. You could just go do a search on LinkedIn and say, well, you know, here's a whole bunch of like, you could, you could set up some baseline analytics in like 15 to 30 minutes of work on here's some patterns of what this asset looks like. Do we want to activate this asset? And that's the, the making visible to the C-suite as a way of navigating. Because obviously C-suite, you know, has like, what are your priorities? What are the kind of the, what are the budgets? What are the things, you know, uh, even if it's a, you know, kind of a 10 or 20% project time, it's like, they like to see that you're doing something interesting, but it's a, it's a, it's a channel to present something, you know, kind of potentially interesting. Anyway, so those, those would be some initial comments. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I was going to say, uh, Chris, you've obviously got a comment, but the start small on LinkedIn, you know, activate the asset. It makes total sense, right? It, it certainly lends itself to a clear message to the C-suite that there's a, LinkedIn group of size and scale. We are beneficiaries of that, right? So it, there's a lot, many amazing things you can do with LinkedIn and um, clearly for the avoidance of doubt, but also there are some limitations in terms of data, analytics, engagement, that, that, which is why we're very fortunate to power your online network. But of course, that's absolutely true, right? Which is just start small, show people, here's a bunch of people who at least wanna hear from us. So that is great advice. Chris, um, some feedback from you? Yes, I'm going to invoke the once again the startup of you, which is the great bestseller that Reed and Ben wrote. 
which basically talked about how as an individual, you have to think of yourself as an entrepreneur. And I think that that's true for the folks who are running these alumni networks as well. You have to think of yourself as an entrepreneur. And many people said the definition of an entrepreneur is somebody who does what they didn't think was possible with resources they didn't really have available. And sadly, that is the situation many people find themselves in. I think that there's a couple of things that they can do to do the highlighting of alumni and the increasing the salience for management, top management of, of alumni. The first is, you know, work with the people who do the speaker series and make sure that some of those speakers are alumni of the company. It's easier when the company's been around longer, of course. But if you can do that, it highlights the value of working for that company in terms of allowing you to do something amazing. And also inspires both the current and former employees who might be watching. So I think that's a great little hack that I just love. Uh, the other thing is, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you're also thinking about MVP, minimum viable product. How do I prove out the value of what I'm doing? And that may involve, you know, seeking out allies, people who run one business unit or one team who want to experiment with doing more with the alumni out of that group or, or, or unit. And, at a smaller scale, work with them to deliver real results. And then it's easier to go to management and say, hey, we did this in this corner. Look how this experiment worked out. We didn't have to do it for everyone at once, but now it looks like we've learned some key lessons that would allow us to really generate value if we spread it out broadly. So thinking of yourself as an entrepreneur, building up those proof points, that is one of the ways as an alumni professional that you can really, I think, help, as Reed put it, change the minds and influence the minds of senior management of the C-suite. That's such a good way to think about it. I often think to myself, like I get, of course, we all about the things we're passionate about get full of energy, but I'm so full of energy when there's a lone alumni manager doing 65,000 things with not very much. And probably it's because they just resonate with me because they are attempting to kind of, you know, move a few rocks uphill with a, with a little pinky. Um, yeah, hundred percent. And I guess, you know, what we're also saying is that you want to tell people it's good to be at your company, but it's also good to be from your company, right? That's the kind of pervading message. Um, if I may, I'm going to take a, a couple of, of questions that we've got from people here. I will uh, avoid some of them because um, they're quite detailed on software, but we'll pick up on one of those. The first one is from Faith uh, Wainwright, who is from Arup, one of the leading uh, and largest engineering consultancy firms in the world. She says, do you think the ability of a firm to leverage the value of their alumni network, Intel, is dependent on the firm's internal maturity in sharing knowledge freely? That's quite a profound question. Do you have views on that? Well, I would say that it's um, it's like it's one of those questions that that obviously contains that the awareness from Faith that it, she already knows that the answer is yes. I know, her and, then, like, and, I, and that's true. <laughs> right. um, but then the details, and so um, what I think is organizations learn that by learning that they win better by sharing and learning information various ways. It's like, um, <laughs> there's the, <laughs> the there's Mac. Mac to be honest, Reed, it's a bit like one of those TV studios where we're coming at you from the left and suddenly we move to the right. It's just with voices. So that's, yes, yeah. <laughs> yes exactly. Um, and so, um, you know, basically what I would say is, um, you know, what you, it, it's not a static, it's a dynamic. No one's at a hundred, maybe some people are at zero, you know, and you know, it's a simple metaphor, but you can increase it in, in various ways of doing it. And the way that you increase it is that people start seeing how they win from that sharing of information. Now, part of course, the challenge is, is producing that information to share, whether or not it's getting it from the alumni network takes work and it's discouraging when you do work and it's not used, right? And so, so there's an ongoing kind of quieting thing about not sharing information. So you really have to kind of, make that going but that means is you you have an iterative plan for what are the most key things like for example in engineering services one of the things might be um you know it depends on for the specific organization but is it like is it you know like the management consultancies is it revenue perspectives is it new kinds of technology um is it like for example right now if you say hey we could if we had access to our alumni, we could poll them and saying, what are you seeing with ChatGPT? Given those the whole, because then people pay a lot of attention to that, you know, as an instance, but like, think about it as not as a go to the full solution, but a steps which get people going, well, that's really interesting. How do we get more of that on a systematic basis would be the way of doing it. So think about like, as it were growing the muscle uh, as a way of doing it, but it's a, it's a, you know, the short answer was yes. <laughs> Chris, anything you want to add? 
Well, yeah, I'll, I, I'll just yeah. add one one quick hack because Reed and I love hacks of various kinds. Um, the one quick hack is that most companies will tell their employees what they cannot share, but they rarely tell their employees what they can share. And it's always a, people may say, oh, well, that's better, right? We, we just tell them they can't share this and then everything else is shareable, but there's uncertainty around those things. People don't want to take the chance of, oh, did I, did I get this wrong? So being explicit about what kinds of interesting stories and lessons are shareable can be very effective because it helps people to know, okay, this is a safe area for me to talk about what we're doing. And, and Reed, sometimes, you know, Reed and I, Reed is, is working on a lot of interesting things and having explicit guidance on what we can and cannot share is, is very useful. Yes, I'm sure. And we've got quite a lot of specific questions. Um, and I think um, they have nuances. So for example, we've got Charmaine from Shell who's asking, is it advisable to start with a pilot program before going for a global launch? From my perspective, we get asked that every day. Sometimes we do MVPs. Sometimes very large companies want to go global day one because it's a bit hard sometimes to say, hey, we just want to keep in touch with this little pocket of people. But of course, there are ways to do that. You are both given blitz scaling, which the listeners might not be as familiar with. But given you have built businesses and, and, and think about starting small and going from there, do you have any advice about whether one is better than the other? Because, I mean, we all know one size doesn't fit all, but maybe you have a view. Well, what I would say is a framework is uh, pilots only make sense if you're going to learn something useful from them. So, for example, if a pilot is too small to be useful and you're not going to learn anything, like like you're not going to get a positive signal, then then it makes sense to go larger scale than that uh, as part of it. So you have to think of like, will we actually test and learn something? And most of these things, they're alumni networks. You need to have a network needs to have a certain critical mass, certain vibrancy. So you said, well, we wouldn't call one person. It's a pilot. It's like, well, that's clearly not a pilot. So you have to say, what's your minimum viable product in order to have the network, you know, kind of tested. And that's the kind of thing you have to kind of reason through in a framework. Now, sometimes you go, well, the whole kit and caboodle, too expensive. Don't know if we have resonance, product market fit, that kind of stuff. It's like, okay, so what's the thing that's a minimum scale that you would get there in order to do that? On this one, Chris is just nodding. Yeah, so I'm like, Chris, yeah. That, that, yeah. and then the other thing, uh, the other thing would be, you know, blitz scaling. The thing about people forget about blitz scaling, it's a competitive strategy. And blitz scaling means to prioritize speed over efficiency for the sake of competitive strategy, for the sake of advantage. And in the alumni organizations, you know, the forcing functions may, dif may be different because you don't necessarily have competitors trying to set up other alumni organizations for your company. But there may be a forcing function, like you said, a large layoff or an anniversary or something like that. And under those circumstances, it may make sense to go faster simply in order to really take advantage of that particular forcing function. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we've got Jaina here, who um, is from the Nike Alumni Network. And she says, what is the size of an alumni community that demonstrates critical mass or vibrancy? That is a hell of a question, Jaina. And maybe now I read it. Uh, I've, I've uh, just dropped Reed and Chris in it, but they're pros, so they'll come out. <laughs> Go, Chris, I know you're being pointed I, at. I, 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 always have, I always have thoughts. Uh, whether they're valid or not is an interesting question, but I always have thoughts. So, I mean, I think that the, I would not, I would turn around and say it's not necessarily strictly a matter of size, right? Which we'd measure by number of members or a percentage of former employees. But of course, as Reed would say, it, it's all going to vary because uh, Nike has a lot more former employees, has been around a lot longer, and the metrics might look a little bit different. What I would say the key question is, is when you build this alumni community, the signal of critical mass or vibrancy is that the alumni themselves are connecting with each other and that it's a true community. It's not a one to many, it's a many to many kind of thing. And I think about this in, in various communities I see all over. Like in many ways, I often ask, okay, here's my question. Does the mailing list you have result in conversations on a regular basis? If it does, then obviously it's working. If it does not, then for whatever reason, you don't have a community, you have an audience. 100%. Yeah, and I think the question, like, like again, kind of framework of how to look at it is, you say, well, what what creates? Uh, it's almost like thinking of like like the starter motor of a network. What creates it so there's energy and activation that's kind of spreading, right? Like if you don't see and 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 by the way, you kind of want to get it to a point where it's 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 got a got a good like an engine, a steady state, or kind of growing. 
that that's the kind of thing you're looking for. And by the way, in some places it might be as small as 30 and in some or 20. And in some places it may need to be a thousand, <laughs> right? It's kind of the question of what's, what's the dynamic now, obviously if you're doing class notes, 20 doesn't work, <laughs> right? You more need like maybe even, you know, a thousand plus. Um, but anyway, that's the, the dynamic of it. That's why it's configuration about, about what you're, what you're, what you're actually doing. Thank you. I've got two or three more questions I think we're going to get through. One really a good one that's come in that we get asked a lot from Leslie, who asks, should current employees be invited to be part of the alumni program? Uh, generally speaking, it's a great question. Um, and you do want to have the connectivity between your alumni and your employees. That's the strong positive um and kind of ways of doing it and it's kind of i think a question of of how you're doing it um you know as a as a way uh, to make it happen it's like you know we have the alumni coming to to um you know kind of our speaker events other kinds of things um but generally speaking i think the answer is yes i do think the question is is kind of like question is like what's the way that you again make the dynamic of the interaction work well <laughs> right and what kind of what your your goals are doing. I think one of the things that we've done at, um, you know, kind of LinkedIn is that some of the times the events we, we have people who are like, when we have a, like, like as we're a class of alumni coming, we'll have some other people who are employees who are also part of that class as part of that kind of reconnecting and, and making that happen. Like those are the kinds of things to kind of think about, but it's, 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 it's with some um, design to make the dynamic work really well. Yeah, 100%. And Vicky, who is from Randstad, says she uses current employees as engagers in their LinkedIn group, which is understandable because it's exactly. hard. Um, it, it can be hard to sort of mobilize uh, with such an enormous group of people, which is what a LinkedIn and my group is. It is quite a lot of people. Um, a question motivated by me, but one I think about a lot and one we get asked about. If I had a dollar, for every time the word LinkedIn or Reed Hoffman was mentioned on a call where people are starting to understand alumni, I would be off on a small island right now. Um, but you know, large companies, they like data, they like automation, security, programmatic approaches to things when it comes to scale. You know that best, both of you, given what you do for a living and have written about, um, which is where we come in on the alumni piece at Enterprise Alumni. So when we are talking about alumni management software, and I mean, I'm, I'm quite a few years into this, People often say, well, isn't that what LinkedIn does? So, Reed and Chris, how do you feel? How did you feel when you clocked Enterprise Alumni, given that you're both such a big advocate for alumni and advocates for software, investors in software? Where did that sit when you were like, okay, there's an alumni software company? Well, look, I think part of the transformation of the world that, that is happening is software is this kind of medium by which we kind of organize our world, communicate with other people, share networks with people and so forth. And it's part of the reason why, like if you were saying, hey, uh, companies should generally speaking, focus on their kind of alumni networks and you were in the 1990s, you'd go, well, actually, in fact, it's only a very limited number of them that are very large scale and have very direct you know, ties to that. Because like, for example, you know, like universities, you have to be like, would we, would we have to be publishing a magazine in order to make that work, <laughs> right? You know, as kind of instances. And part of what's happening is software changes the landscape of what happens here. And so, you know, part of um, that is it, it brings down the cost curve. It allows network activation. So just like, for example, you were mentioning is like, well, in my, uh, you know, LinkedIn alumni group, we were in current employees because the current employees have some things that are kind of interesting to them. That's, that's content to share. That isn't the opening, the office in Madrid, but it's like, Hey, you know, like there's this pattern of work of what we're seeing. That's actually in fact, particularly useful that causes some, you know, conversation that they can generate, you know, kind of useful connectivity, useful Intel, you know, kind of uh, possibly sales channel, possibly recruiting channel, you know, all of that is, as, as part of how it operates and software changes the curve of that. So, it's the product in the world as it, as it should exist. And that's part of the kind of software transformation. And so I think it's a, um, you know, and then it's kind of a question of, you know, it's classically when you get kind of an investor's perspective is like say, okay, so 
how do you go from the initial size to a mid size to a compounding size? What is the 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 loop of the kind of sales organization the the sales process look like? You know, one of the things that um, you know I think is you know kind of another you know kind of interesting use of LinkedIn here is is it's a place where you will naturally see people being pretty active. So the the question about going and saying, hey, I've got something here for you, you know, becomes a channel for that. Anyway, it just those are a set of kind of different, you know, puzzle pieces uh, within the broad scope of the question. Uh, but generally speaking, how software kind of changes our communities and our networks is obviously we're 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 still in the very early phases of. And the classic thing is, you know, in, in our industry, there are horizontal solutions and there are vertical solutions. And horizontal solutions are great, especially in cases where there's a strong set of network effects. And obviously, LinkedIn isn't going to be going anywhere. It is the default way that people have a professional identity online. But being a horizontal platform, it is not necessarily a vertical solution. And the specific vertical solution of alumni, LinkedIn groups are great for alumni. LinkedIn groups are great for non-alumni groups. LinkedIn groups are used for a lot of things. And by nature, the LinkedIn group cannot be specialized just for the needs of people who run the alumni networks for the companies. So it's a great thing to have both, to have LinkedIn and enterprise alumni. Well, I mean, just for the avoidance of doubt, I haven't paid either of you for this. But um, <laughs> if I had have done, that would have been what I'd asked you to think about. But it's, you know, ultimately it's true, right? You need different things for different jobs with different sizes and scale of communities. Um, I will leave you with one last question, both of you, even though I would like you to stay on the line for about 25 hours and keep this going. But you might get cross with me. So if you were, I don't know, you know, what will come to mind, but if you were re rewriting the Alliance, you know, 10 years on, you were refreshing the front cover and you were like, hey, it's time to give this an update. Not that there's anything wrong with the messages in there, but you've learned a lot in the decade. What would you be saying that was perhaps different, you know, employee employee engagement, employer branding. When I had my first job in a large company, that I don't remember that ever existing. And now it's becoming a job title that we see more often. Is there a version two? And even if there's not, are there things that come to mind that you're like, oh, that could be the next installment? Things well, well, as first of all, obviously we're very busy. We would love to, and we hope that we will somehow find the time to do the 10th anniversary edition of the Alliance because so much has changed the rise of the gig economy, the impact of the pandemic. There's so many things we want to comment on. Now, in terms of significant changes, I think actually one of the most interesting ones is just what the impact of AI is going to be. With the Alliance, we write about the creation of the tour of duty. We write about you know the work that the manager has to do to do regular check-ins and how do they work together with the employee to figure out their values and aspirations. And there's a lot of work. And frankly, you know, managers are busy and people are busy. And that may be one of the things that has kept people from really adopting it broadly. But as we bring more and more of these AI tools online with the ability to sit in dialogue with an individual employee, sit in dialogue with an individual manager, help bring them together, I'm really excited about the fact that AI may be able to amplify the human connection of managers and employees. And that's something, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I'm really excited to see what happens. Yeah, we spend a lot of time thinking about that and how we can kind of escalate teaching people and feeding back to people using, you know, obviously ChatGPT and all the things you're mentioning. One last thing from you, Reed, whilst I noticed that my ponytail is obviously like getting, is covering the most important of the logos. I've just noticed that, Reed. What a devastating. I better put my chair okay. down for the last minute so you can only see my forehead. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, much more important to see you. Um, what I would say, and Chris and I have been, um, talking about this because the tr the trend line of companies needing to adopt this new world is 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 in full force and the current you know uh reshuffle from the pandemic and then the reshuffle from the company side um you know is kind of redoing it is amplifying the importance and needs of these networks and what i'd say is um you know probably the key thing that we didn't that we were a little bit more uncertain about or undetermined, un un uncertain around undetermined, is we knew that we were partially talking about a world that we were seeing coming from Silicon Valley and we didn't know how, 
how fast it'd be spreading in other industries. And I think the short answer is it is, right? And it's not just because of things like, well, the pandemic hits retail and hits a bunch of other stuff, but it's because, um, you know, it is actually, in fact, not just the technology industry, but we live in much more of a networked world uh, in which w this happens. And so the question about how to think about your company in a networked world and what are the networks that it lives in is, I think, really key and the and the employee alumni is a key part of that. And so I think we would, you know, in uh, updating the book and what we would write now, we, we would lean more into as opposed to, well, this is things that we're seeing coming from the Silicon Valley side of the world. It would be the, and we're seeing it happen in every industry and at, 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 at more depth. And so it's, it's, it's more imperative than ever that people had, um, uh, adopt to this. So, well, sign me up. I will have to send you some of our bespoke gifts, which is the alumni blend of candle. Remember the good times at your former employer. So we also <laughs> think about that. And it's like, you know, mm, isn't that a lovely smell of where I used to work? Um, thank you both so much for joining. Um, you know, you've been hugely impactful, um, certainly personally for me in ways that more than almost I can't think of anybody else other than my family. Um, and I'm sure that everybody else is going to really enjoy listening and learning from this because, um, you know, you've had a lot to share. Thank you very much, both of you. And thank you to everybody who joined us today. And Emma, thank you.